Hey everybody, welcome to the White Girl Bleed a Lot uh, Google Hangout. This is Colin Flaherty. Uh, here we talk about racial violence without racism, without rancor, without apologies. We talk about black on white crime, the knockout game, black mob violence. And tonight we're honored to be joined by uh, psychologist Marlon Newburn. Now Marlon was a prison psychologist and a court appointed psychologist. He had a long career, 30 years. Now he's a college professor. But you know, I, I don't think there's anybody on this planet who has heard more excuses for black mob violence and black crime and the knockout game than I have. I've heard a thousand of them. I hear, I mean, that's what I do all day. I read stories where people do this really bad stuff, then they come in and they give excuses for it. Well, I remember when I first met Marlon, we were talking on the phone, and he put all that in perspective. He got it all squared away, and man, it is really an honor. Marlon Newbert, thank you so much for joining me here tonight. No, you're welcome. Glad to be here. You know, so we talk on the phone a lot, and when we do, I'm always saying, oh, man, we got to do this Google Hangout, so I'm really looking forward <laughs> to this, because you're saying things to me, anyway, on the phone, I, I think are very important. You're not excusing. You're telling people what the hell's going on. Like one of the yeah. things I, I find interesting is when you talk about all the case studies that not not case uh, well you, the studies you've done of the criminals. What do you call them? not case studies? Uh, evaluations. Evaluations. Like yeah. say for example, if I look at a Mike, if I look at a Michael Brown, Saint Michael of Ferguson, that to me, I've never seen anything like that before. But that's not what it's like for you. Not at all. He's he's completely. That's the uh, the most common personality on the street in black communities. Well, break you it down for us. When you see Michael, as if he walked into your office, that type of person. If he walked into your office, what would you be looking at? I just know that he's living on impulse. He's got the emotional maturity of a pre-adolescent, eight to twelve years old. Um, he does not see past his nose in refer regard to his choices he's going to make. Everything's immediate gratification. Whatever feels good, do it. And if anybody gets in their way, uh, gets in my way, I, I have to beat them up or I have to harm them. Because on the street, fighting is primary, paramount. The more sadistic, the more brutal, the bigger dude you are, and the better you are. I that's mean, that, so that's, that's the world he is living in. That's the world he's living in, yeah. He's just garden variety. Trayvon Martin, same way. Give it, break, li- break his, break, when you look at him and all the stuff you learned about him, break that down for us. Same thing. He's doing, living his preferred lifestyle, living on impulse, getting high, getting high is a religion. Yeah, what's that, there's, some people insist, that, I want to talk about this later, but some people insist that White kids and black kids, white people and black people, you smoke pot, use drugs in the same amount. Is that your experience from uh, the court system? No, no, not at all. Um, it's marijuana is pretty common, but primarily drugs and alcohol in the in the inner city and in black communities is just common. It's what they do: getting their drink on, getting their high on. If you ask, um, if you ask a cop, they'll they'll say the same thing. Yeah, it's it just is. You know, one uh, thing one thing I found really was interesting, you were the first person, maybe I just wasn't paying attention, but you were the first person to kind of explain to me the relationship between this incredible level of welfare dependency and mm-hmm. and kind of infantilization. What, what, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like and, um, first of all, when you start removing personal responsibility from a kid, it's like, and of course my students in class, they ask, when do you hold people responsible? I said, when they're age two, they know right from wrong. You teach them right from wrong. And from there. Now, if you do not, and then you keep bailing them out, and then you keep making excuses for them, and then you keep rescuing them and removing personal responsibility, there's no incentive or neurological growth to grow up, to mature to make you realize whatever decision you make get you where you are today. I've had murderers in prison tell me I can't believe God let this happen. And I would say, these are black guys from the inner city. 
I say, did you murder these people? Well, yeah. I said, so it's God's fault. Well, you know, he could have stopped it. It's okay, just so never. Let me, ask, let me ask you this. There's a 16 or 17-year-old black kid in your office. We see this on the yeah. news all the time. Yeah. He's in trouble. His his mom comes storming into the office. More oh, yes. often than not, what happens? That's a guarantee that he will be a repeat offender. I guarantee you. I will bet you a year's pay. If the mom when comes mom in does that, and does that. One thing I noticed when parents do that, they want to be in there when you're evaluating or, you know, talking to their kid. I want to be here. Well, right now I'm going to talk to them. I'm not a cop, so I need to talk to them, get their opinion. No, I'm going to be here. Or if the parent, I'm just talking to the parent, they'll be very kind and sweet and loving and all that sort of thing. I mean, you know, the civil. But they say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring my son or daughter. The daughter's in trouble, too. I want to bring them in here. Yeah, okay. As soon as they, they bring the child in there, and I say child, I mean 12 years old, 13, they turn into demons, the parent does. How dare you? You should be understanding and caring. They're talking about you are the demon. Yeah, I am the demon, yes. Now, so how often does that happen when a parent will – I mean, we see it on the news all the time. There's a kid, there's a kid gets arrested. The mom will come up. We just saw this in in, the most famous case of this, to me anyway, was a few months ago in Indianapolis. A uh, cop gets out of the car to confront somebody carrying an AR-15 rifle in the ghetto of Indianapolis. Yeah. The guy takes the gun, shoots the cop. The guy's family said he was a nice he's a, he is a nice kid. The cop never should have gotten out of the car. It was the cop's yeah. fault. And how, how often do we see that? And, and how, a, what's the most life, Yeah. It's standard. In a criminal's life, it's standard. The thing is, the black community has got politicians that do it for them. Uh, anywhere you have an inner city, you have a democratic. You know, let's not be talking about politics too much, but no, we can talk about politics. They have, Isn't they have legions of people to make excuses for? Well, them. here's the thing. Last so last night, the president is on BET, oh, and yeah. he's he's telling everybody it's all about racism. Yeah. Uh, isn't isn't that kind of like taking to what you're talking about to the to the extreme? Abs to the extreme, yeah. He's he's guaranteed another generation of criminal behavior and an increase in it. One of the things the street black thug, and I call them thugs, you know, not what I'm evaluating, but they call them thugs. One thing they believe is that because there's a black president, we're in charge. They're extremely tribal. It's a black thing. We're in charge now. I can do more. I can do this. It's you had people right. tell you that you've had people tell you that in prison. It sounds like. Yeah, in prison. Yeah, sure. The ones that belong in black gangs, um, even the uh, Nation of Islam, which that is, it's a hate group, and I'll go on record for saying that. I mean, it's hate white people. Hate Asians, hate Jews, and so we've got this administr. I I I want to get I want to get into more specific stuff, but long long yeah. as we're on the topic, so we've got this president, attorney general, and all these cabinet members. It looks like everything they do, it looks like they're looking at it through the lens of race. They seem all, extremely all they race conscious. It is a religion. It is a religion that we are. They have this imaginary love affair with pain. <laughs> We are put upon, we are abused, we are just mauled. Who kills who the most in the inner city? And who's doing who's doing all this abusing? Who's, yeah, black people are doing this abusing. Well, in, in their and fantasy world, who's responsible for all this bad stuff? White people. Uh, white people, yeah, yeah. If all these opportunities were not available to me, and I stop them right there when I'm talking to them, counseling, I say, wait a minute. Just by your race, by your color, you can get a job. You can get a promotion, and you will get a promotion over somebody more qualified than you. You have 50 years of set-asides, preferences, everything laid out, and you really don't have to qualify for anything. Show up. So let's start from the beginning. You had a, Well, the school was bad. I, uh, a lobotomized beagle, if they could speak English, I would learn something. You are illiterate. You can barely write your name. How do you get to be 
19 years old and you can barely read. But I, I read, that but I, re, I read these books, I listen to these people that say that the reason there's such a disparity in, in schools is because there, there, too many white people are, are teachers. Too many white people teach. The Detroit's black had, no, no. Detroit's had, and Pontiac, Michigan, and Flint, vast majority of teachers are black. Okay, and all all that's happened is the quality of education has taken a nosedive, and so the argument that it takes a black teacher is ridiculous. I've had black teachers professors, black uh, instructors in the military, black instructors, and I'll be darned if they didn't teach me something. Well, there's, there's a, always there's a ready-made excuse for a street predator. There's a book out called Courageous Conversations. That's the manual that teachers use when they go to a seminar. The seminars are conducted in hundreds of school districts around the country. A guy named mm -hmm. Glenn Singleton and his people come in. And they teach the teachers. And the way it works is you have a lot of, usually if there are some older teachers, but a lot of newer teachers, a lot of new white women, young white women teachers. Oh, yeah. yeah. The first thing they do in these classes is uh, they explain to these these, these fresh college graduates that the problem with black children, the reason there's a disparity is not because of income, neighborhood, police, mother, father, all this stuff. There's only one reason for all this disparity and that is white racism and you are the problem. You thought you were the solution. You thought you were coming down here to solve things. You're the problem. And they yeah. really kind of shake a lot of people up. Oh, and by the way, if you raise your hand and you go, uh, I don't think um, I don't think I'm one of those people. Um, they don't fire you. That's but in, in the teaching game, they say we're not going to renew your contract. Yes. Yeah. So 50 years of this, re you know, relieving responsibility, special yeah. treatment. I mean, behind every program, what these set asides you're talking about, yeah. isn't the backstory of every one of these programs? White people are evil, and white people are keeping yeah. you from what is yours. In their intelligence and in their thinking. They believe they're righteous and they're helping. It's pathological altruism, of course. Stick helping. And they remove responsibility, but it also infantilizes them. In other words, as long as they can do whatever they feel like doing and somebody's going to make an excuse for them, nothing will change. They can do what they want. They can drop F-bombs on a teacher, black and white. Now the black teachers are feeling it. Hey Marlon, uh, hold a up a second. Let me. You know what? I think some people want to ask questions, so let me. Uh, okay. Let me do this. If you want to get in on this conversation, I think there's probably a complicated way to do it. Why don't we do it a simple way? Just uh, I'll keep an eye on my Twitter stream. So the Twitter, it just tweet anything with the word. You know, just put at Colin Flaherty in there, and I'll see it. How's that sound? So Mar Marlon, this is the first time I, we. Well, uh, until I met you, I never heard of the word infantilize. Yeah. Before. What's that mean? Infantilizing is when you remove responsibility for somebody's choices, uh, for their decisions, and remove the consequences. That's a big one. What happens is that person learns to make poor decisions, usually immature decisions, impulsive decisions, uh, and they realize it works for them. And so, and, every, one thing, and so every day I look at these videos from, from uh -huh. schools, grade schools, high schools, yeah. And um, right now, the D Department of Justice is going around the school districts saying yeah. if there's any difference in discipline between white children and black children, that could be one reason, one reason only for that because of racism. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the uh, practical consequence of that kind of decision? That'll, that'll increase the violence. Guar I guarantee you that. That will increase the acting out, increase the assaults, increase the uh, behavior problems in school. It'll cause... It'll turn into a war zone, really. Eventually, no, Marlon, Marlon, I'm I'm sorry to tell you that only 99% of the teachers I've ever met will agree with that. So there's still a one percent <laughs> difference there. So it uh, here's the soon, thing, teacher. Now that not, now it's not just kids beating each other up. Now, yeah. if you go to my web page, uh, YouTube page, you you see teachers, kids beating up teachers. Teachers, of course, because they know somebody will make an excuse for them. And there's one thing that most people don't understand, the law-abiding people don't understand, 
is they also, the criminal loves this chaos. They love the attention they get. They love what they happen. They, if they get a criminal charge, they get a free lawyer. They get to, and mom gets to go down there and defend them, and a lot of theater behind it. That's cred for them in the black community. Dr. Newburn, yeah, uh, mom, mom, mom. Mr. Uh, Mr. Professor Newburn, can I ask you a question coming in on yes. our Twitter stream? Yeah. Let me put on my drugstore reading glasses here. Colin, ask uh, Mr. Newburn about the relationship between black mothers and their sons. What is that? What is he talking about? Well, uh, that, yeah. What what is the what what is the what is the questioner talking about? Yeah. Well, what what about that relationship? Uh, he he seems to think that when he sees it on TV or when he sees it in the newspaper, it seems kind of weird. Uh, how 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 the mother will protect, react, enable all that stuff. Is there anything weird there, or is this just garden variety garden variety enabling when you run across somebody like that in prison? Oh, in prison, no. Mama always going to defend him. They're a good boy, and they're real helpful, and he's kind and loving, and you guys are just picking on him. And a few have come right out and said, you white, and you don't know. Okay, it's The idea is mom usually, these, these mothers, white mothers too, uh, they have a drug problem themselves, or they're living their, self, their life of vicarious living, uh, usually off the government breast, and they're doing what they want to do. This little way to show Junior... Look what a good mom I am. And I call these mutant parents. Okay, the ones that defend the indefensible. Your son has beaten this woman up, set her on fire, and killed her, and you are saying he's a good boy. I'm having a hard time processing that. Could you help me out? And, and what do they say when you say and that? They say, well, you know what? He does go to church. Is it, I, you, think that's, you think that in itself is true? Uh, no. No, of course not. Lying is a way of life among the criminal uh, population. And in the black community, it's epidemic. The can, we talk about the, can we talk about the preachers for a minute and church for a minute? Yeah. Because every once in a while, I hear somebody say, well, Colin, we've got to get the preachers involved. They're going to gonna get that squared away. I'll tell you something. The preachers that I see, the preachers that I experience in my little humble little town of Wilmington, Delaware, yeah. they're part of the problem. Absolutely. They're, the, they're doing the enabling. They're doing the. Yeah. They're all about the Reverend Wright stuff now. They're all oh, yeah. about the. You know. They're all about the the white racism. They're all about the police. Are, the police are the problem. Yeah. It's uh, actually it's the profile of an alcoholic. I mean, I've treated and evaluated. I don't know how many alcoholics in my life, and these are grown people who've got to uh, blame somebody for everything. Is that is and, that a, is that a characteristic of the alcoholic? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And um, but when you talk to these, like I'll, I'll counsel a black felon, you know, in prison over several weeks, and I'll ask say, where do you get this whole thing about white people? You even admitted you weren't even around them. You're from Detroit, Pontiac, Flint, Benton Harbor. Uh, these are in Muskegon. These are black communities that are hell holes. And uh, they'll say, well, you know, where do you, I say, where do you learn this? And they'll say, in church, at home, elders on the street, older people. You know, and they'll uh, say, everybody knows that. <laughs> Mar you know, Marlon, uh, you know, Jesse Lee Peterson, our, a guy we both admire out yeah. there in L.A., he, he speaks yeah. to this a lot. And yeah. when he goes into an audience, he'll look at everybody and go, um, black people don't like you. And that yeah. really, it's really kind of a hard for people, white people, to get their minds around that because yeah. how, how do we act? You know, in our in, in our lives, we're constantly looking inwards for that little tiny little spark of racism. We're trying to snuff it out, get rid of it. Yeah. And, you know, you see black comedians like, uh, Kit, I think his name's Kit Kat, he, he, they even make fun of that. But the fact is, all this violence that goes black on white, I mean, sometimes, you know, we hear people say, what's behind that? And they give all the, the answers, the excuses, right? Well, at the bottom of it isn't, I mean, if you're going to go up and punch somebody in the nose or kick them in the head, um, mm -hmm. it's because you don't like them. Yeah. Yeah. And so, where, these where black this, Sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, what, what about, what, what, where does all this, this, this racial resentment come from, and why does everybody take such comfort in it? It's because they 
have this distorted and perverted idea that it's liberating for them to blame somebody else. But it's really out of the thought processes of a pre-adolescent. If I can have somebody, that means I'm good. I, if I take responsibility away from you, and you can do whatever you want, and I'll defend you, I have carte blanche, and I will stay that way. I will never grow up. I'll become infantilized, a little kid. As a matter of fact, me and several others, not on, in a pejorative way, but we would say, you know, uh, you, well, you have people out, prisoners lined up to see you. Um, okay, um, how many kids do I have out there? That's how I'd say it. How many what? How many kids do I have out there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay that's what you call the prisoners. Yeah, these are the ones, you know, that I finally have in prison because they have an emotional maturity level. They're completely infantilized of an 8 to 12 year old. So if a corrections officer just looks at them wrong, well, he hates me. I'm going to get him. I'm going to cut him, you know. And of course, I'll report him if they say that. And then I'll come back and I'll say, psychologist is not supposed to tell you, tell anybody what they talk about. They already know. I said, you know the rules. If you threaten staff, well, they think, they think they're that above rules that no matter, even if you tell them, I should be able to say whatever I want to say, and nobody should say anything. And I said, you spent your whole life threatening and beating on people. Well, that's where I come from, and that's okay. And I said, well, in a civil society, it's not. And But they absolutely believe that they are righteous, and the reason... Now, I understand that the vast majority if not all, have never held a regular job. They've never got a, gotten up in the morning with a pack of lunch, gone to work. They have lived on the street, lived the preferred lifestyle. None of them. And that's one thing where white felons have it over the black felons big time. Many of the white felons have a skill, a trade. Auto mechanics, carpentry, brick mason, this sort of thing. So when they get out, they have a job. Really, they could find one. Um, blacks, do you know? They know nothing. They reject a formal education. Many of them have to get a GED. The ones that are going to be paroled have to get a GED before they can be paroled. They will avoid school like the plague, because one of the things that they have wonder, more than anybody else, self-esteem. They think they are 10 feet tall and bulletproof, just like an 8-year-old. And they're, they believe they're brilliant. They are, if they can, you know, formulate a sentence more than 10 words, they are right up there with Rhodes Scholar. However, when they go into a classroom, which is, these classrooms for GED are around the 8th grade level. Uh, reality hits them that they don't know the state capital of Michigan. <laughs> Okay, you yeah. know, here's the thing. Let me ask. Let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what we have is, um, so, so, uh, so, when you're watching TV, especially the last couple weeks between Ferguson and New York, yeah. and so we see all the talking heads, and mm -hmm. nobody on TV is talking about this. Forget the criminals. Forget the, the forget all the rioters. Forget all the the people yeah. committing all this black mob violence out yeah. of proportion. We see all these very polite people in nice suits, some white, some black. They're all just excusing all of this. And, and, and not one person looks at it and goes, no, that's not a good idea. I mean, what's up with all that? Well, that, the thing is, the thing is they're celebrating their own narcissism. Look at me. I'm defending the poor, imaginary, downtrodden black thug. And it's like extortion. If we give them more stuff then they will change. Well, how's that work? From, from my perspective, after 50 years of this, it's been not just a dismal failure, but it's increased the problem. Okay, I have, a, a I, I, have a, I have a bone I need to pick with you, if you don't mind. All right. So, last week I did an article for American Thinker magazine. Mm -hmm. It was about Dave Renzel. He used to be a writer for uh, oh, yeah. Southern Poverty Law Center. 
He was walking sure. around through Oakland. I did a story that said he got killed by a couple of black thugs. And uh, kind of the point of the article was this guy had celebrated uh, this 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 whole racial grievance bit industry. He celebrated yeah. the whole idea of white racism, how blacks are constantly victims of white racism. And he was killed by uh, yeah. a couple of black guys in you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Sure. He was not very happy with me for pointing this out. Mm -hmm. I guess you know. Last year they blamed me for the Boston Marathon bombing, so I guess you know. Yeah. I'll be compare us with that. <laughs> anyway, it's so anyway. I sent the, I, I I gave you a ring and you told me. And, and I've always been interested in the these 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 the, the Dave Renzels of the world and the people yeah. who defend the, the, all this criminality. And you gave me some great quotes. And then when you know when the article came out all anybody wanted to talk about was not this brilliantly written article all anybody wanted to talk about in the comment section was the genius psychologist and where has he been all my life <laughs> there's a lot of us believe it or not forensic psychologists you know I'm clinical background but there are a lot of us in the field however it makes people who are like the Runzels of the world God rest his soul but it makes them a lot of money they're playing the black community like cheap fiddles. Uh, when it comes to down and dirty, do the dirty work, psychology, do the evaluation, give them the testing, find out, you have to bring the bad news. And the thing is, if they, somebody, imagine a leftist politician said, gee whiz, the uh, programs of President Johnson have been a gross failure. They're not about to do that, okay, because it will cut off the cash flow. Okay, let me ask you this question. It seems yeah. like it seems like okay, the the big thing over the last year is all about white racism. Okay, all the black yeah. pathologies, all about white racism, all the time, and it's going to be that way forever. It seems like we push the psychologists out of the room. The psychologists, the whole whatever this whole like psychology thing is, it doesn't matter anymore. I mean, are you guys That's even? Right. Are you, are you guys important anymore? Are you relevant? No, um, except when they're facing trial for murder or something like that. And, of course, that information is kept uh, usually suppressed. However, um, let's put it this way. I've had good attorneys, good, good lawyers. Um, they know I write straight-up evaluations. I have written them in the past. However, uh, they'll refer me a client for a psych full psychological battery. I'll give it to them and they find out and they learn that their client is a psychopath. They learn that their client You're is a indeed a bad man. And there's no conscience. I get paid now. I understand that. They pay me good money, but they'll say, oh, we're not going to use your evaluation. <laughs> what, what did they think they were going to get? Uh, you got me by the nose. And a, a couple have told me they don't know each other. These attorneys said, I asked for it because I don't want to look like a jackass in court. Because I know my client's lying to me. And I said, oh, so you gave me two grand <laughs> to cover your no. ass. Yeah. It's a, Part of right? language. Yeah, no, you're right. That's what they said. Yep. Because, you know, I mean, one of the worst things successful criminal lawyers uh, have told me, and I know quite a few good ones, real good ones. They will tell you, boy, one of the things that's a career damaging thing is to look like a jerk in court. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, well, that's what they've told me, yeah. And I said, look, do air is human, brother, you know, but they, not, not for a trial lawyer. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let me throw a sentence. I'm gonna throw a sentence at you that I I just wrote an article about the other day. I don't know if the paper will use it or not. The, the story, the the sentence came from my old hometown of San Diego, California, and there mm -hmm. the head of the NAACP came out and said, st "This is yesterday or two days ago. Statistics prove it that white people and black people commit the same amount of crime." but it's just that black people get caught and white people get away with it. Now, in San Diego, they estimate, you know, the black people are 5% of the population, but they're responsible for about 30% of the violent crime. Mm -hmm. So, here's my here's my question. Doesn't that mean there's like 10,000s, tens of thousands of really really violent and murderous white people running around San Diego? 
and nobody has kind of figured that out by now? <laughs> uh, yeah, that would take um, the biggest stretch of the imagination to believe this guy. I mean, I mean just, okay, if that's the case, true. we have all these, this is what this would have to happen, right? If black people and white people are committing crime in the same amount, but white people are getting away with it, that would have to mean that all the cops are in on it, the jury's in on it, the prosecutors, oh, yeah. the, and the newspaper is yeah, in on it. It would have to be, yeah. And it's, but here's the thing. So a reporter hears that, and a reporter just writes it down, says, oh, great, great, thank you. No, I mean, why doesn't, I mean, what kind of person... Would, would would listen to that and go, oh really? Could you tell me more about that? I mean, why wouldn't they say that? Well, it's because it's not part of the game plan of infantilizing black people and feeling sorry for them and being kind and nice. Over half of all violent crime is committed by three percent of the American population. That's talking black about male yeah. black males between the ages of fourteen and thirty five. Three percent. Okay, over now, half of all the murders. It, it, this is like count the bodies. Okay, so John yeah. Conyers on on the floor of the Congress two months ago, yeah. and I have this on my YouTube page. He said same thing. He said if you took the cops from black neighborhoods and put them in white neighborhoods, you'd arrest the same number of people for the same thing. That not two nights, a couple nights after that, the president is giving a speech to the Black Caucus. The president starts talking about a justice gap, uh, this gap between white people arrested and black people arrested, and it's all because of one thing, one thing only: white racism. And yeah. these guys, these guys are do all doubling down on this now. They're not backing up. They're, you know, they're all in on this whole racist thing. Obama, Holder, yeah. you know, EPA, the Labor Department. Um, uh, at some point, is, every, is everybody, I, I tell you what, I can tell you a lot of people are getting sick of it. A lot of people really reject it. Um, yeah. I'll ask you the question everybody asks me that I never know the answer to. How's this How's this all going to turn out? Uh, there, eventually, you know, let's put it this way. Detroit, which is the absolute Lagos, Nigeria of Michigan, uh, even black people le left it. <laughs> the ones... That were decent, hardworking. It's like we've had enough of that. The black governance, black schools, the violence. You're, you're a native of Detroit. Uh, is, yes. Yeah. I went to college there. You lived down there uh, when Coleman Young first got in office back in the early 70s. And uh, was he uh, just, was he kind of a leader in that whole blame white people kind of thing? Everything with Coleman Young was it's white people's fault. They could the mayor and his uh, psychophants, they could do anything they want, and when everything popped up, it was white people's fault. White people's fault. Is uh, are, are your crime went? I want to get back to court just for a second. Do you, do you find any of your colleagues more willing than you to do the whole he's a victim of racism kind of thing? No, uh, no, 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 it's no. Uh, you know, it's I'll get them in groups and I'll say, you know, what do you think when somebody a potential employer tells you no. You know, the fact is, in reality, employers will say no. Somebody's going to say no to us in our lives. And the fact is, you know, plus these guys, they're so infantile. Excuse me, infantile. Uh, they turn into latrine lawyers. We used to call that in the army. You know, if a cop wants to stop them, they all of a sudden want to become this latrine lawyer. You have no right to do this. And you have no right to do that. Well, I see a lot of that now. Of course. I mean, they've, they've, that's been going on since I've been in my career. Uh, they'll turn in, for instance, Michael Brown walking down the middle of the street. In black communities, that's common. Kids walking down the middle of the street and stopping traffic, and they won't get out of the way. That's They do that. And until a cop shows up, move up. Of course, they got to drop some F-bombs on the cop. They can say anything they want to a cop unless they put their hand on them. So the cop will get them out of the way. Um, it's just fun to do. The black felon likes to humiliate their victims. It's, it's all muscle, power, and humiliation. That's, they do it in prison. So you get one of these uh, white uh, guys selling meth on one of the uh, small towns here in Michigan outside of the 
black communities, and he gets sent to prison, and he thought he was a tough guy. Well, these guys automatically zero in on him and, you know, beat his brains in. And these guys want to get out of prison so bad, they have no idea these people you're talking like about. This. You're talking about a white kid. Yeah, yeah. They get a they get an education. Could you and they'll say, why do they cry whine about so many things? You know, <laughs> Could you tell us what a Bronx jury is? A Bronx jury? Yeah. A Bronx I jury. Don't know what a Bronx jury. I, I just learned this a couple months ago from David Simon, the author, the creator yeah. of the TV show The Wire. A Bronx jury means a black jury will not vote to convict a black. Oh jury. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The uh, stack jury we call it, but it um, yeah because they think they're doing good by removing responsibility and rescuing from a consequence. This is epidemic in the black community. Rescuing, blaming others uh, from consequences of their actions. So if it's a stack jury, they know black. There are some pretty prominent black attorneys here in Michigan. This was some years ago. Um, they argued they want more blacks on juries because a uh, jury of one's peers doesn't include white people. Don't know what it's like to be black. You know the other and day. That's the old Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg argument. So the other well, day, she's lost for one of her people. So yeah. Well, yeah. The other day in the in the New York Post, there was an article about Bronx juries. Except yeah. this was said in Brooklyn. A cop was saying, a defense lawyer was saying they're panicking because the jury pool is being polluted by all these white people who don't mind uh, who don't mind voting to convict people. Yeah. Right. I tell you what. In my neck of the woods here in Michigan, predominantly white now, my, I don't live in urban areas, uh, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's white, blue collar, uh, middle class and some white collar, you know, but mostly blue collar, this sort of thing, country folks, farmers. If an armed robber was caught up here, how much time do you think he would get as opposed to a, an armed robber in Detroit? How much? Oh, 45 years up here. <laughs> He'd go to prison for a long time. The well, juries, once they heard the evidence, they get the hell out of our community. In Detroit, if you get a conviction, he's going to get, you know, 10 to 20, maybe. Let me okay. contrast that with something that just happened uh, two nights ago in mm -hmm. Delaware. Wilmington. Mm -hmm. Triple shooting, one dead. The police were not involved in this shooting. Cops, yeah. cops roll to the site. The crowd starts attacking the police. Yeah, this is the third time this has happened in this little town in the last 12 to 18 months. And the weird yeah. thing is, when the city council—I don't have a life, so I actually watch the council on the cable channel. But it's ver they're very instructive. But the, the council, when the council talk about it. They're always taking the side of the people who are fighting the police. They're always of taking course. the side of the attackers. And it's never yeah, – and, and I've confronted a few council people about this. I say, listen, go back and watch your own videos. You'll see that you're always talking about the predators, never the victims. And yeah. you know, when, I, when I sold this to a couple of them on the air and off the air, they look at me like, wow, you are crazy, man. <laughs> but it's know. true. It is true. Yeah, they do. It's uh, they'll defend the people. They'll kill them. Okay. I mean, it's that simple. And these little talking heads that get it voted into these inner city uh, councils and all that sort of thing, uh, they get to play dress up. You know, uh, chances are the community city will buy them a car, or let them use a car free, and all that sort of thing, and they can. Style their brains out. All they got to do in is go the party line. And then every once a year they come out with all the crocodile tears about all the crime, and we got to do oh, something yeah. about it. And you know, it's like, well, first thing you can do is probably stop excusing, condoning, denying, ignoring, and justifying it. How does that sound? Yeah, give that a whirl. <laughs> no, they're not about to. There's a fine line between the black felon in prison and the left wing black politician. And it's a very fine line because they both blame like crazy. They will both try to put a label on you anyway, you know, of 
racist if you say something that holds them accountable. And they both do like dressing up, and they both like living like peacocks. In Philadelphia yeah. uh, last year, um, the, the local district attorney did a sting that involved sending a lobbyist into these lawmakers' offices yeah. with cash. Yeah. In the meantime, they had a new attorney general. The only people who took the money were five or six black, five black office holders and one black judge. Absolutely. And Absolutely. This, these, the new attorney general of Pennsylvania came in, and she said because they only ensnared black office holders, that was proof positive of racism, and she wasn't going to take that. She dismissed all the charges. Oh, yeah. That's why it happens so much in black communities. That's why it's fleeced. Detroit is third world. It really is. Do you know how many billions, with a B, of dollars of federal money, state money, has poured into that city only to see it get worse? Now, hold on. And I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. Because I happen to know a little bit about this. Because I heard a Rolling Stone reporter on NPR tell me what was going on in Detroit. Yeah. He said, the only reason that Detroit is in the condition it's in, Marlon Newburn, is because white racism let it get that way. Now, what is wrong with you? <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I the, can't, Rolling Stone and NPR, you want to take on those two? Go ahead. Make my day. Oh, no, no, sure. I, anytime. <laughs> Uh, the Detroit City Council has been, uh, you ever hear of that book, Confederacy of Dunces? Yeah. I mean, it's like a comedy act, this bunch. Uh, they fight like children, call each other names, can't account for millions of dollars in their budgets. The jobs aren't done. Streetlights aren't on. It's like giving a drunken kid, I'm stealing P.J. O'Rourke's line, the writer P.J. O'Rourke, like giving a teenager a bottle of whiskey and the car keys. Hey, you know what? Yeah, like, like, <laughs> hey, you know something? No, there is, some, there is, a, a, however tiny, there is a green shoot in Detroit. What you mm -hmm. you, you probably know that last January, earlier this year in January, the chief of police went on TV and said, "People, we can't defend you anymore. Get a gun." Yeah. And within that the next three or four months, uh, there was I don't know, ten, twenty, maybe even thirty people sh were shot in home invasions. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, it's because finally they got a conservative. Now, he admit, this new police chief, that the first time in since the early 70s they have a white mayor. He's a Democrat. Um, and they have a conservative black police chief. He admits himself, years ago, he was liberal. Then he was a police chief of, of a town in, out on the East Coast. I think it was in Maine. And they had... Uh, they, there was no condemning citizens who protected themselves. And he said that was an incredible learning experience for him. An armed public, legally armed public, is a safer population. So he hired him for Detroit, and he's saying, look, defend yourself. Protect yourself. And, and I think we the crime rate in Detroit has, has plunged. It has since he's taken over. Yeah, it's like he will not accept excuses. Can I take a second? Can I take a second to give a thirty-second yeah. uh, rant on crime rates? Sure. So the crime rates between white people and black people are, like we just talked about, astronomically out of proportion. But Absolutely. Even then, even then, they're re they're they're not accurate. Like for example, in the city of Baltimore, they have a party. If they clear, they call it clearing. If they can figure out who committed half of the murders, that's like mm -hmm. astronomically good for them. You take one step out of the city into the county, they're clearing 80, 90, 100% of the murders. Absolutely. And so all of a sudden, we have all these murders that don't show up in the categories of like who's committing this crime. In Detroit, yeah. the clearance rate is 25%. So yeah. as bad as the numbers uh, are, they are way, way worse. Yes, because of the no snitch rule in Detroit. No snitching, witness intimidation. Oh yeah, yes. In, ba in One Philadelphia, thing. in Philadelphia, the district attorney said witness intimidation is now at epidemic levels. Sixteen months, oh, they brought twenty five hundred yeah. cases. That's only the ones they prosecuted. Yeah. So we got yeah. that. We got stitches for stitches, witness intimidation, 
In Baltimore, exactly. New York, they now brag that they're only arresting half of the people they yeah. arrested a few years ago. Then you go to sure. a Bronx jury, and so mm -hmm. even if they arrest you, the jury's not going to convict you. In Oakland, That's right. in, in Oakland, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, they put in a sh it's called Shot Spotter. All these mm -hmm. microphones on these like telephone poles, and they yeah. they they send a cop to where a gun has gone off. They found yeah. in the first three. This comes from the New York Times. They found in the first three months in Oakland that 90 percent of the gunshots were not reported. Then we have Melissa Harris Perry on MSNBC saying that there's a lot of domestic violence and rape among black people that is not reported because black women believe black men will be the victims of white racism and a police at the, the criminal justice system. That's She's six a poster girl for excuses. Come on. That's six reasons, six solid reasons why the crime rate, as bad as it is, is, is way worse. And guess what? If you want to throw the Oriental crime rate right in right here, well, that's like that's like a nuclear argument buster there. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Why don't she they commit just, some crimes? <laughs> Who's that? The Orientals, the Asians. Uh, very rarely. <laughs> so they're too busy working, studying this sort of thing. I have uh, evaluated probably in my career three out three uh, Orientals out of all the years I've been working. So, so is there any chance? That's it. Is there any chance they're actually committing all these crimes, but they're just getting away with it? Uh, no, no. There's a there's a, there's a thing called a shame, a healthy shame in the in the Asian community, where you do not bring shame upon the family. It's like when I was when I was growing up, we didn't act out because it would make the family look bad. Okay, well, obviously I'm a generation. I'm from the '60s and all this sort of thing. I never bought into that. You know leftist crap, you know, this I was in the military. But the thing is, it's uh, there's a sense of family honor, and you do not cause trouble and bring... Remember the, uh, uh, the, the Asian schizophrenic, I'm not making excuses, he was known as schizophrenic uh, Asian, I think he was Korean. Yeah, you're talking uh, about the, the guy in uh, Virginia. Virginia Tech? Yeah. The family went on record apologizing, apologizing, we are sorry to America, to uh, Virginia Tech, for what our son did. Can you imagine a black person doing that? But it rarely happens. Now, one of the chapters in my, my book, that's scintillating <laughs> bestseller, White Girl Bleed a Lot, is, uh -huh. about, is about black on Asian crime. I mean, every oh, yeah. single one of these store owners, they're, they're, they're robbed in the store. Yeah. They're, they're off a ro you know, they're very aware that people fo can follow them home, do the home invasion there. There's an enormous mm -hmm. amount of black on Asian crime. In San Francisco, they did a study of it. They figured out that like 90% of all the assaults in the city were black on Asian. Oh, yeah. Because of, um, you understand that the black predators, they pick on what they believe the easiest targets. Somebody they think they can humiliate. Beat senseless. I mean, really hurt them. Well, hold on. Too I much damage. Stop, may I stop you there? Yeah. I, I'm told they do it because of desperation and they need to buy a loaf of bread for their starving uh, little brother. Never. That is the biggest lie, I mean, among the criminals. They have never stolen for to eat. They have never done that. They do it for recreation a lot of the times. They just say, I'll ask them, which psychologists, most psych clinical psychologists don't ask why questions, but once in a while you can't help yourself. And I'll say, why did you do this to this old person? Why did you do this to this, I don't know, some dude, <laughs> bored? You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of old, I mean, there's a lot of 65, 70, 75. I'm thinking of a, a 911 call I heard of a couple of people in their 90s who were the victims yeah. of home black home invasion robbers. The the level yeah. that, that it's hard to measure this, but it's not hard. It's not hard to figure it out. The not only is the great the rate greater, it seems like the intensity and the sadism is also off the charts in a lot of these home invasion oh. robberies. That's the result of defending the black felon. I mean, today, what did we have today? How, how many? In, in the last uh, two two weeks, there have been two black murders where they set the girl on fire. 
Yeah. Well, in my line of work, that's one of the things that black males, young black males do. It's the ultimate humiliation, and it could be a black female. They'll send them on fire as well. It's the ultimate dehumanizing thing to do. You understand that the most vicious among black predators, the more vicious and heartless you are, the more status you have in their group, in their community. So, you, you know, gotta, anybody, who's like ever, they, anybody who's <laughs> ever listened to rap or read rap lyrics right, cannot agree it. with that. Yeah, I mean, come on, it's a celebration of sadism. Indulgence, no impulse control, addiction. It's, it's. Uh, these are hymns <laughs> for the thug world, for the criminal world. You know, this, can, let me. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left. Let me kind of go full sure. circle here. The reason I wrote "White Girl Bleed" a lot, and the reason you and I are talking on this uh, Google Hangout on air right now, is because we don't learn about this in the press. And no, no, and I'm I'm stepping up the thing about writing more and uh, publishing, working on that book again, and back to another edit. So, um, but the thing is, it's uh, it's just it's been common in my field. And so a lot of people they'll buy a home in a an old in a gentrified neighborhood, and they yeah. don't know, or they'll send their kid to college in a certain place, and they don't have any yeah. idea what they're in for. Correct. They don't. So that's why what we're doing here is actually kind of important. Yeah, I think you've probably saved more people's lives with your book just in the last year. I'm, I swear to I'm not just telling it to stroke you. I'm telling you, you have probably saved more lives with that one book uh, than all the do-gooders in the last 20 years. Oh, well, thanks. It's, the fact is, really, I mean, think about it. Well, how many people have written a book like yours? And well, I'm you know, thinking, if somebody, my else, first if, if, if somebody <laughs> else had had written a book like that, the book with like kind of fact based, uh, yeah. No, no, no racism or rancor. I, I, I would have said fine. It's already done. No, and if somebody who had busted yeah. started busting these reporters for consistently misreporting yeah. these stories, I, I would have yeah. walked away from it. But the reporters are so oblivious. I don't know if they're oblivious. I don't know if they're cowardice. Absolutely. I don't know if they're ignorant. But for one reason or another, they won't connect the dots. They won't tell people this unbelievable level no. of racial violence happening. These are the same sure. reporters that do stories about black colleges, black churches, black radio, TV, yeah. newspapers. But when you ask them about what's up with this elevated level of black crime, they look at you and they say, Colin, I'm colorblind. So what is it about these guys that make them so eager to ignore all this stuff? It, it's strokes their egos. Their narcissism runneth over. They can seem above it all. Brilliant. That's all knowing, people, all seeing. That's really important for some people, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Self-image? When you are so narcissistic where you have to invent crap to keep your self-image above you, uh, I've graduated from Columbia. Well, what does that make you? Okay. Educated. And uh, the fact is they have this inflated opinion of it. People that are raised since kids, white kid people, their children are special, they're great, they're wonderful, they're geniuses. A lot of these turn into these kinds of people. Uh, of course, they eventually get cut by the law, the ones I see. And I've had them tell me, you know, I was could do no wrong when I was growing up. And, of course, they got into the drugs and they believed they were 10 feet tall, bulletproof. and That's you know, what narcissism does you, it just blinds you to reality. I just got a, a I just got a tweet and a text about something they said is happening in Texas. But I've been following this in New Jersey, which is the amount of black on Asian home invasions. But I think they're really talking yeah. about the Southern Asians, the Indians. And yeah. uh, a lot of times they'll follow people home, and they have this idea that there's a, a safe in all the houses. Lots of horrific violence going on, and. Yeah. Um, Nobody's connecting the dots, except for the, you know who's connecting the dots? The readers are. People yeah. are getting so aware of this. They're really demanding yeah. uh, the people at the newspapers do a better job. I mean, it's like I, I'll just say this. I'll stroke myself here. When um, when I go to do research a story on on black mob violence or some crazy level of black crime, a lot of times I'll just see in the comment section somebody will just say uh, these words. White girl bleed a lot. Five words. That's yeah. all they say. Yeah. And the thing is, 
I don't care what people think of me. I just say you have to stay out of black neighborhoods. I, I've had communication with a lot of people with Europeans, um, Germans, French, Austrian. They're going to come over. I tell them you have to avoid black communities in America. Nine out of ten Germans will accuse you of being a racist for saying that. No, I know it, yeah, but I say it anyway. If there are people I care about. So here's what happened last year in Chicago. And um, they had a white, they, they picked up a white woman at the airport, took her to jail in the ghetto, let her out. Within an hour or two, she oh, was thrown off of a seven story building. Her family sued, and they got a sociologist from Harvard to say a routine activity theory a white person in a black neighborhood can routinely expect to be the victim of some pretty nasty violence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that judge, is reality. The judge cited that. And you know, every, it yeah. seems like every week I find another poster child for, for routine activity theory, including maybe this guy yeah. Renzel from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. It's like common sense would tell you, don't go there. There is a danger element. Black, I don't know how many black felons, who, most of them are doing life. They're not getting out. So when they come to talk, usually they want medication which they're denied because they don't need it because it's a high and they'll talk to you and they'll I've had talks with them and they'll say our you know our porter that came in I said so what do you do on the street of course I lived in the inner cities too I'm not a silver spoon kid and uh, they just say they see a guy that looks like an easy mark let's go check him out that's how they said or let's get, hit a lick let me ask you this. So relate that to the knockout game. Isn't that either some version of the knockout game? My, my definition of the knockout game is people who beat the hell out of you just for the hell of it. Yeah, exactly. And if, they happen, if they happen to rifle your pockets, I mean, that's, that's ancillary. Or yeah, whatever. that's just, uh, they just do it. Look, when they get thrown in jail, who do you think they run into in the jail on the cell block? Who? Their friends. Hmm. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. They say this is not a foreign environment for them. First of all, they got cred. They went to jail. Uh, they're in there. Their homeboys are in there. They say, what's up? You know, Friday's chicken day. You know, I mean, I had one tell me that. Can I get out of this? Um, I was doing a jail evaluation. Uh, can I go now? Why? It's Friday. It's chicken day. No, you got to be here for a little bit more, you know, so. Well, I won't get the best pieces. It's no big deal. There's no shame in going to jail in the black community, okay? Their homeboys are in there. They're not lonely. And all they want mama to do is put a few bucks in their jail account so they can buy some potato chips and Slim Jims and all that sort of thing. And that's uh, when they come to prison, same thing. Hey, this is cool here in this this one. I worked in three prisons up here. Uh, this is cool in this one. I got, you know, about eight, eight of my homies here. It's hey, like that means family. Me we're almost out of time here, so let me just kind of wrap it up and tell people sure. where, where they can find this. Um, this is going to go on YouTube. It, 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 here's a, I'm going to give our listeners and viewers some homework, Marlon. I'm also going to yeah. make a podcast out of this. If anybody uh -huh. knows a psychologist, ship them this copy of this tape. If you know any cops, don't ship them the tape. Just ask them. What we're, just tell them, hey, I heard these guys say this and that the other day. See what they yeah. say. I guarantee you, I know what the cops are going to say. The cops are going to say, that's what I would say if I were allowed on TV and I wasn't going to get fired for it. So oh, anyway, yeah, they would. Uh, yeah. uh, so in wrapping up, let me just say that uh, listen, come over to our YouTube channel. Uh, sign up for my uh, go to my whitegirlbleedalot.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. I've got a book. I've got a, I've got, I, I published a little ebook on the knockout game where I yeah. put together some stories and links. It's the most links, stories, and videos ever assembled in one place on the Knockout Game, and you can get it free if you go to my webpage, just sign up mm -hmm. for it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, man, Marlon, you're really knocking it out of the ballpark here tonight. I hope we get a chance to do this again. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Come on, let's get, keep getting the message out. We could save a life, you know. So the, the mental health portion of this, this is not a mystery. It's common sense. You don't even need a psychologist. A good cop can tell you the profile of a street predator, a black street predator. And they have. So anytime you want, let's do it, bud. Marlon Newburn, uh, every time I write an article with you in it, everybody always wants to talk about what you're bringing. I think you're doing the most important 
stuff and psychology in the United States of America. Gosh, Ooh. I wish. And, you know, I, when I go, I do all these talk radio shows. I think I'm like wow. half of them. I'm going, hey, there's this guy named Marlon Newburn, and here's what he says. And they all go, boy, Colin, you're very smart for saying what Marlon says. I go, hey, thanks. Anyway, listen, this is great doing this. Uh, I hope everybody got something out of it. Hope you'll follow the. Hope you'll subscribe to this on YouTube. Keep an eye on us. Um, and Marlon, uh, it's been great having you. Say goodbye, and we'll get out of here. My pleasure. It's a lot, Marlon.